rights. Hillary Clinton. She'll raise the minimum wage. Take on the drug companies. And if I have anything to say about it, the United States of America, 15 bucks an hour. Would raising the minimum wage to $15 per hour fix the economy? In fact, why stop there? Let's say everyone got paid at least $40, or even $100 an hour. Now, for one person, going from $10 to $100 an hour would dramatically improve your standard of living. Let's say that everyone was making $100 an hour, at least. Is the U.S. economy capable of physically supporting a living standard en masse that such an income could support individually today? In other words, leaving money aside, do we have the productive potential? Do we have enough infrastructure, food, medical care availability, production, and goods to provide everyone a dignified standard of living? No, we don't. And that sort of economy can't be made simply by changing wages. To start thinking about the economy, the first step is actually to forget about money. Instead, start from this chart. Here we see human population, and there is absolutely no other living organism that has seen such a transformation in its population. All other life has what biologists call a carrying capacity, a fixed value of the number of that type of life that can live in a given area. Other forms of life consume resources around them, but they don't produce them like we do. Unlike any other form of life, we can change the number of human beings that can live on this earth and how we live. So how do we do this? And what does this tell us about economics? Here in this short video, I'm going to present two basic concepts from the economic theory of Lyndon LaRouche. Those two concepts are energy flux density and potential relative population density. But first, Let's look more at the central mystery of economy, that human ability to make discoveries. It really is an underappreciated miracle that our minds are capable of comprehending the unseen causes of effects in nature. No animal does this. No animal discovers principles of nature and uses it to transform its relationship to it. We demonstrate that we have such knowledge by making new things happen. We plant crops. We irrigate land. We domesticate and use animals. We produce new materials that never existed before on Earth, such as bronze or metallic aluminum. We use the heat power of coal, mined from the ground, to boil water, create steam, and run engines that are not powered by muscle, wind, or water. We turn coal, rocks, into motion. We transform the Earth and our relationship to it. We go to the moon. Unlike all other life on Earth, we are consciously not an earthly species. Think about it. These discoveries that made modern life possible, they're available to us all. But how much do we know about how these discoveries are made? How much time is spent entertaining ourselves rather than learning or acting? And in education, how much time is spent reading textbooks instead of going through the original works of the geniuses that brought us what we know today? How can we measure the economic power of these discoveries? How do they increase the productive powers of labor? This brings us to the first economic concept to discuss in this video that was developed by Lyndon LaRouche, the concept of energy flux density, which we can define as the density of power applied to the productive process in the economy. A laser is a very concentrated form of power. Think of its use in cutting materials and compare it to metal cutting instruments. That's an application in the small. Let's apply this concept over a longer time scale and in a broader way. 
consider the first use of energy in the form of simple fires used for cooking and for new material transformations like boiling and bending wood, making glue for arrowheads, and heat treating stones to make chipping them easier and to make sharper tools. Then think of the higher temperatures available with charcoal fires and the ability of charcoal fire to be used to transform rocks, ore, into metals, bringing in the bronze in Iron Ages. And then think about how engineering advancements in metals and machinery, combined with the abundance of coal and pumping technology for mining, allowed us to save forests from being burned to make charcoal, and allowed us to use coal to build the steam engine, and allow much more labor to be done with less human effort. Just think about how that discovery increased the potential living standards of humanity. Goods that could have been produced by hand only for the very rich could now be produced by powered machinery on a much broader scale, and the physical human labor required to make the essentials of life could be reduced. Then think of the concentration of energy flux density that came with the development of electromagnetism, with power plants, motors, electronic control of machinery and production. This allows another leap in the ability of the economy as a whole to support a higher potential population density and higher standards of living. Then in nuclear processes, we find power concentrations that are 100,000 to a million times greater than in any chemical process, greater than in any possible fuel. The as yet unmade breakthroughs in this new region of nuclear knowledge hold the potential to dramatically transform our life. Abundant power, new materials processing, space transport and travel, just to name a few. Being able to deflect an asteroid on a collision course with the Earth by the use of fusion rockets, now that would literally be a priceless investment. So increasing energy flux density is a marker of economic advance. To think about the second topic from LaRouche to cover here, let's look back at the chart from the beginning of this video. This is a chart of actual population. But now think in your mind what the human population could be at different points in time. That is, if you were to consider all the technologies, knowledge, cultural and social advancements and concepts available at a given point in history for a given civilization, could you determine its potential population density? For example, how many more people can live in a square kilometer in a civilization that has developed agriculture versus a hunting and gathering or fishing culture? So with the potential population density as a rough measure of economic advancement, let's use this concept to gauge economic value. Does a society act in such a way that it is increasing this value, allowing more people to live and to live better? Or is it, like today's transatlantic world, allowing this potential to stagnate or even decline? So real economic value defined this way in increasing the ability to advance the potential population density rather than thinking of it as making money. Economic value is the ability to improve our lives and their meaning, rather than simply increasing numbers in the bank's computer. This depends on those uniquely human discoveries that change our relationship to nature, which define it. And most importantly, we can engage in that process of discovering. The advancement of society, the advancement of physical economy, allows more and more people to be able to engage themselves socially in understanding and developing for themselves new concepts that drive mankind forward. Economic value lies in increasing the rate of advancement of potential population density, as seen in economic systems of increasingly higher energy flux density and greater productive power of labor. A policy that promotes this has economic value. And if it reduces the potential of our thriving, like 
supporting Wall Street gambling rather than investment in the future, then it has negative economic value, even if it makes a lot of money. So with these two measures as a start, energy flux density and potential population density, we can look at the economy in a meaningful way with metrics that free us from being fooled by money. It really all comes down to the fact that economy is based on what makes us all human, our ability to discover and implement valid ideas. The policy proposals made by the LaRouche movement over the decades have been based on this outlook, and they're now being widely adopted in the form of the World Land Bridge, the New Silk Road, the One Belt, One Road program, as well as in the Chinese Lunar program, including its stated goal of developing the helium-3 fusion resources of the moon. The greater intensity of energy applied to production, transportation, and daily life that's made possible and utilized by this outlook represents an increase of energy flux density in those economies, and it certainly transforms the potential population and living standards. It's time for the U.S. to adopt a new paradigm. In fact, it's past time for this. We must again become a useful and necessary people for the world. So there's much more to learn about these policies and about Lyndon LaRouche's economic method. For more on LaRouche's economics, check out the site at lpac.co slash EFD and check out these related videos. Leapfrog the existing power of production. This means we must examine the critical factors which increase productivity technological advance, and its associated rise in energy flux density. The nucleus emitting two protons and two neutrons, together called an alpha particle, or a single electron, a beta particle, or a high energy light-like ray, called a gamma emission. So the amount of energy that could be given off was astonishing. It overthrew the law.